Hi, everyone. This is Angela Brown, project lead with the YCC program. We are ready to get started with our webinar today um, on the grant closeout process. So thank you all for joining us. We're really excited. We know a lot of you have had questions and have been sending them in and asking your FPOs. Um, so we did want to get this information out to you as soon as possible. Hopefully you all received the invite in there. There's links to the YCC Community of Practice. And on there we have posted two FAQs. We are going to be talking through some of those. So you may want to have those handy or ready to open them if you're by a computer. If not, you can always look at them later. Um, because we'll be doing FAQ questions at the end. As always, throughout the presentation, please send us your questions, whether it's through the chat or the Q&A, so that we can answer those. We have um, staff from the closeout office here at DOL, as well as our program staff that are going to be ready to answer questions um, as we go throughout the presentation. So please send those in. As you think of them, um, you know, we may stop at different points to answer them or wait till the end, depending on what types of questions do come in. But send those in so we have those recorded and can answer those um, as we go through. So now I am going to turn it over to Marin and Avery to start the presentation. Sorry, I should start with our objective. Sorry there. Um, first, we're going to discover how to prepare for closeout. Um, we're going to talk about some of the closeout elements you need to have in your package, um, as well as some common issues that can close or, sorry, delay closeout. Sorry, my slides are like not. Here we go. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Marin and Avery to um, go through their presentation. So thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting us. Again, my name is Avery Malone. I'm joined here with the closeout grant officer and supervisor, Marana Safa, as well as our leadership for the department, uh, or excuse me, the Division of Policy <laughs> Review and Resolution, Latanya Torrance. I'd be remiss in my duties if I didn't take the moment to thank them for the opportunity to allow me to present to you all today. We're always excited and very happy to get some kind of a reach out from the program office or the grantees with regards to what they should expect with the closeout process and how should they prepare for it because a lot of times there are issues that we encounter that can be avoided if we're given information in advance. So we hope that going through this presentation, we will provide you with enough information to make you comfortable with the closeout process that we will facilitate a smooth transition throughout the process in addition to introducing you to the individuals of the closeout unit and just opening up the lines of communication. So with that being said, we will begin and let's see if I can. So I was given a clicker and I'm not quite sure. Okay, here we go. What is grant closeout? So essentially the grant closeout is a part of the grant life cycle where the federal awarding agency, which is us, makes a determination as to whether all applicable administrative actions and all required work of the federal award have been completed by the non-federal entity yourselves. On the screen you should see we've identified several code of federal regulations that relate to the closeout process and post-award requirements. So you see 2 CFR 200-343, which gives a layout of specific closeout requirements that are both um, actions that must be taken by the non-federal entity as well as the federal awarding agency. So that just gives you an outline of what's expected at closeout. You also see a reference to 200.344 post-closeout adjustments, which just provides further information with regards to, although we have officially closed your grant, it does not relieve you of all obligations that may come into play after the close of the grant. For instance, um, if a reward, if a refund is comes to your attention as to something that should be returned to the government, just because the grant is closed does not mean you get to keep that money. <laughs> so we also have 2 CFR 200-345, which gives you some insight with regards to how we go about collecting any funds that we determine are owed to us. 
Lastly, we have two CFR 2900 subpart D post federal award requirements. And essentially that's a part of the uniform guidance which gives background information with regards to administrative requirements, uh, cost principles and audit requirements related to our grant awards. Who we are. So as I stated at the beginning of the call, we are the Department of Labor, Employment and Training Agencies, Office of Grants Management, Division of Policy Review and Resolution, headed by Latanya Torrance. She is responsible for three units under her care, which is the policy unit, the audit unit, and closeout unit. And this trifecta pretty much provides the entire framework with how to administer your grant award and ensure that any complications that may have arisen are addressed appropriately. Again, we just want to facilitate a workable agreement between all grant recipients and the federal agencies because we're here to help. So with that being said, the closeout unit consists of the grant officer, actually there's two. Moran is the supervisor and grant officer of closeout and I assist her in whatever capacity that I can as a grant officer as well. We have seven resolution specialists on staff that are highly trained. Um, as you can see, we say we're closing out roughly anywhere between 700 to 1,000 grants a year. So our workloads are heavy, but the specialists that we have are more than capable of handling this task. Again, as I stated earlier, the most important thing here is communication. We keep our lines open, so we just ask that you ensure to keep your lines open as well. Preparing for closeout. So this slide is just giving you a little bit of background information with how we in the closeout unit go about preparing for our workload. As you can see, 700 to 1,000 grants is not necessarily the easiest thing to manage, but somehow, some way, we've done that on a regular and very successfully. You're in good hands. <laughs> we track our anticipated workload a year out. Um, essentially, we get an information report that is run for us by our IT office. They provide us with information with regards to grants that are a year out from their um, period of performance end date. We then take that information and compare it against what we have in our electronic grant closeout system. Now, the very last point we speak to is that not less than seven days from your period of performance end date, you should receive notification regarding the expiration of your grant and beginning preparation for the closeout process. This is just a fail safe. In reality, our specialists are so good at what they do, normally they will contact you a month in advance. However, if you get to this last week and you have not received any information with regards to closeout, we ask that you reach out to your FPO or I'm not sure, program office, and they can definitely send the email to Moran or I, and we will make sure to get the process started. Again, things can happen, but for the most part, we get them out more than a week in advance. So closeout begins. Within 45 days after the period of performance, you are required to submit your final 9130 financial report. That's for the very last quarter of that report. Now be mindful that in box number six on that report, you will have a little radio button that allows you to check either yes or no with regards to is this your final report. You wanna make sure that you click yes. If you do not click yes, you will not get access to the closeout financial report, which is another report that you will have to submit for the purposes of completing the closeout process. So 70 to 75 days after your period of performance, your resolution specialist that sent you an email with regards to the beginning of the closeout process will follow up with a reminder just in case you haven't submitted any documentation as of that point in time. Mind you, grantees, this third bullet states that grantees must submit all remaining closeout documentation no later than 90 calendar days after the end date of period of performance. Again, we reference the Code of Federal Regulations 
343, which you can go there yourself to see. We're not just throwing these numbers at you. They're actually a part of policies, procedures, regulations that we are required to also adhere to. The last bullet point, grantees may not direct charge staff time to work on close out of grant after the period of performance end date. Keep in mind, although you still have things that you need to submit to us, after the period of performance end date, no additional costs can be charged to your grant award. Closeout continues. So now this is where we get to the meat of what we do in the closeout unit. Hopefully at this point, day 91, you would have submitted every document that is required for us to do a complete and accurate review. We're going to ensure, based off of the documentation that you submit, that you are in compliance with any statutory regulations, um, any terms and conditions of your ward, any requirement that was highlighted in your grant award that you should have adhered to, we're going to make sure that you did based off of the documentation you submit. Now, the next bullet point speaks to all grants should be closed within one year of expiration. According to our Department of Labor Manual Series 2, Chapter 800, that gives us the framework as to the one year that we should submit, we should have completed the closeout process. An additional caveat is the fact that Congress also passed the GON Act, I believe, of 2016, mm -hmm. which means this year we are required to submit a report to Congress with regards to all grants that we have in our possession that we have not closed within a year's time. So unless you want your organization to be on that list, it will be in your best interest to make sure that you keep good communication with our resolution specialists because, again, they are well qualified to walk you through this process with as much ease as possible. Now, under new uniform guidance, awards must be closed within one year of receipt and acceptance of all required federal reports. I guess that's essentially what I was speaking to with regards to the GON Act. Close out deadlines. Now, I believe this does apply to the YCC awards. Okay, so the, doc the information you see on this screen is accurate. I was just confirmed by the other members in this room. Um, September 30th, 2018, your grant will expire. That's when the closeout process begins. November 14th, 2018, that should be roughly that 45-day mark. You are required to submit the final quarterly 9130 financial report. December 30th is when you will submit the closeout 9130 financial report and any remaining documentation that is due. In addition to that, there's also on that 90th day, the last day that you are able to draw down any funds that you are actually entitled to based on uh, expenditures that were charged to the grant within the period of performance. If you do not draw down those funds that you are entitled to, you will be required to jump through a few additional hoops and provide us with uh, explanation as to what took you so long and how you will work to improve your process so that this will not happen again in the future. So here we're going to give you a few examples of some of the documentation you'll see. So based on the notification letter, the initial notification of the closeout process, what you see on the screen is essentially a copy of the email notification that you will receive with regards to your grant award and its expiration. That first sentence usually identifies your grant award number as well as the um, period of performance end date. And if you go down about midway, you see a highlighted uh, URL link that guides you to the actual grant closeout system. What you will find is once you click on that link, it's going to direct you to the same page that you go to to submit your final or your financial quarterly reports. So it looks the same. It's the same front por uh, portal cover, but it will still also allow you access to the grant closeout system. Now, the end user manual. So once your closeout process has started and you receive that initial notification letter, I forgot to mention at the very last paragraph, it speaks to an end user manual that will be sent to you in a separate email. This essentially, this screen is identifying that separate email. 
you have an attachment, which will be the end user manual. And again, just so that you are clear on where to navigate to submit your closeout documents, we have provided the link in this email as well. Elements of a closeout package. Depending on the type of grantee that you are, for the most part, and whatever activities that you've um, the activities that you've actually uh, worked on while while facilitating the uh, the grant award, it will determine which forms that you will actually submit to us. So the final quarterly 9130, and in addition to that, the closeout 9130, that's required by all grantees, as well as the grantees release, the government property inventory certification. Now, with regards to the inventory list, that all depends on, again, what activities that you actually uh, completed on your grant. So if you actually purchase equipment that has a fair market value of 5000 or greater at the point of close out of the award, you will also be required to submit an inventory list to us and document in certain details of that equipment. The grantee's detailed statement of costs is another form. The NICRA, which is the Negotiated Indirect Cost Rate Agreement and a breakdown will be required for any grantees that have charged indirect costs to their grant. The grantee's assignment of refunds, rebates, and credits in addition to that, we have the closeout tax certification. Again, these are just forms that are included in the closeout package. Um, your resolution specialist will be able to walk you through if or based on how you complete those forms, whether or not additional documentation will be required, such as that inventory list or the uh, NICRA breakdown form. So here we have an example of your final quarterly 9130. And again, it looks like every other quarterly financial report that you've submitted up until this time. The only difference is if you look at the very top box number six, you will see yes marked in that field, indicating that this is yes, your final quarterly 9130 report. Now, while we're on this form, I'd like to draw your attention to, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of small, but right under number 10 transactions, you see federal cash. In parentheses to the right of that is a very small, small <laughs> description that's telling you that based on this particular time of this report that you're about to submit for this quarter, DOL records reflect that you have drawn down a certain dollar amount. Now, that amount may be different from what is on line 10E, which is your federal share of expenditures. That's the amount that's circled with a red circle. That's not a problem. A lot of times when you submit your final quarterly report, you may not have drawn down the last payment that you're entitled to since you are to be reporting to us on an accrual basis. That's what the closeout financial report is for so that you can make any adjustments after the fact. Yeah. So we have a question that's come in um, from William Bass out in LA. Is the inventory requirement on the total value of equipment or on each individual piece of equipment over $5,000? Very good question, Mr. Bass. <laughs> it's each. The $5,000 limit is based on each individual piece of equipment. Now, if we have a piece of equipment that, say, includes a computer system with cords and peripheral devices that cumulatively comes to 5,000 or greater, that is something that you also have to report to us. So you can't say, well, the court is $50, <laughs> so I got right under that $5,000 mark. But for all intents and purposes, it's based on individual pieces of equipment. I hope that answers your question. Now back to this financial report. So again, I believe that, are they, do they have a match requirement for this particular grant? Yes. Okay. 25%. So be mindful that if you go down to line 10J, 10K, we are paying attention to the federal share that you are supposed to also add to your grant award. If that has not been met at the point of closeout, 
there will be some follow-up questions that will be asked. So we're hoping that everybody has been mindful of reporting their costs on each quarterly period in a cumulative manner. And give me one second. I see we have another question. Okay, I was instructed I may move on. <laughs> so I will go on to the next slide. Close out 9130. Now, as you can see, it looks exactly the same as your final 9130 report. The only difference is, is here we have a cumulative closeout adjustment column, which demonstrates that there may have been some change from your final 9130 report to the closeout report. Now, for all intents and purposes, the 910E federal share of expenditures, although the one on the screen you see there is a slight difference, we understand that sometimes things happen. But for the most part, that amount that's on your final quarterly 9130 for line 10E really shouldn't change for the most part on your closeout 9130 because if you're reporting on the accrual basis, you should have a pretty decent accounting of all expenses that have been incurred by the period of performance end date. What I would really want to draw your attention to is if you look at line 10A, cash receipts, line 10B, cash disbursements, and line 10E, federal share of expenditures, they're all the same. This is mandatory on the closeout 9130. So although based on the final 9130, they didn't necessarily have to be in agreement, by the time we get to the closeout 9130, you should have drawn down all the money that you're entitled to, you should have dispersed all the money you've entitled to, and that should equal the same amount that you have as your federal share of expenditures. Good question. I was just passed a note that asked, what is NICRA? Your NICRA is your negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, which is given to you by your cognizant agency. I'll probably get a question as to what's the well, cognizant agency. <laughs> yeah. Now, with regards to the NICRA, if you have charged indirect cost to your grant, and I think we have a slide dealing with that. You need to pay attention to how your indirect costs should be calculated. Your indirect cost rate agreement will give you specifications with regards to the base that you should be using as well as the indirect cost rate for each year that you're charging indirect cost to the grant award. So there's one more question moving back to the $5,000 equipment. Um, if the value has dropped below $5,000 from depreciation, does that also need to be included? No. You're right. If it's below $5,000. In regards to your question, if depreciation has now valued that piece of equipment below $5,000, you do not have to report that to us. All right. <laughs> so here on this slide, we just wanted to give you a comparison of the final quarterly 9130 and the closeout 9130. It may seem redundant at this point, but trust me, from years of doing this, this tends to get confused a lot. People think that once they submitted that final quarterly, they don't have to submit anymore, and they will get calls from the specialists with regard to the closeout 9130, and they will, they will insist that they have already finished completing all of their financial reports and it'll be a back and forth until you get an email from the closeout grant officers that you must comply with what the resolution specialist is asking or there may be some consequences. So again, we just wanted to let you see side by side. If you look at 10A, 10B, and 10E on the final quarterly 9130, the numbers are not equal. 10A and B are equal, but they don't equal 10E. But by the time you get to the closeout 9130, all three, 10A, 10B, and 10E must equal. Oh, thank you. Liquidation of obligations. Again, in closeout, grantee may only liquidate obligations incurred during the period of performance. You're not allowed to incur any new obligations after the period of performance ends. And just to reiterate, 
Although you may have staff working to submit these closeout documents to us, those are not charges that you can direct charge through the grant award because the period of performance is already over. Compliance. Closeout tends to be a stickler for compliance. <laughs> <laughs> and that does not always make us the most liked group around here. However, <laughs> if you work with us, we will ensure that we get you through this process as painlessly as possible. So here we're identifying the fact that your administrative costs, there is a limitation on it in your grant award, and you will see that your limit should be a 10%. So you are allowed to spend 10% of the total federal award amount on administrative costs. No more. You can spend less, but no more. If you spend more, you will get an email from your resolution specialist saying that we need you to give money back. We're trying to avoid that. This is the grantee's detailed statement of cost. This is another form that sometimes gives a bit of a headache. I'll try to walk you through it as easily as possible and as quickly as possible so I don't draw it out for too long. We have three columns here. Your very first column all the way to the left is your cost category column. If you look at the top, you see salary and wages as well as fringe benefits. Your total personnel cost, that's already pre-entered. You don't have to worry about that. If you go down a little further, we have other expenses. Now, based on your federally approved budget, your 424A, it will identify certain cost categories that you have been approved to spend federal award dollars on. On the screen, you see an example of travel, supplies, other, and contractual. Now, we appreciate, we appreciate all the help that we get from our grantees. We appreciate the work they do. All I can say with this form is stick to the blueprint that you've been given. A lot of times we will be given additional information, which I understand the grantees are trying to be helpful to ensure that they want us to know all that they spent the money on is allowable expenditures. However, if I see travel supplies, other contractual, and then I see posters you're mailing, I'm going to have the resolution specialist send the email to you to say, please address this edit on your detailed statement of cost. So stick to the budget that you've been given. Now, if we go to the second column, the grant budget, these numbers you will have to fill in yourself. However, once again, you've already been given this information in your 424A, and essentially these amounts should mirror what has been approved in your 424A. We go to your last column, your cumulative costs, and based on that amount, these are based on your actual expenditures of federal award dollars. So with the new guidance that we've been given, the uniform guidance, there is a 10% flexibility on all cost categories. Now this means that cumulatively, you are allowed to exceed the cost category amounts that have been budgeted by no more than 10%. If you exceed cumulatively more than 10%, you are, it will be disallowed, <laughs> plain and simple. However, again, we want to work with the grant <laughs> recipients because we know you all are doing such excellent work. We don't want to penalize you. So if you happen to go over, the best thing to do is let your resolution specialist know that you may have a problem. They will instruct you to provide a justification to your federal project officer and ensure that you CC the resolution specialist so they know that you are on top of this. Once your federal project officer receives this information, they will review it to see if it's something that may have been approved while the grant was still active. They will send a recommendation to close out. And based on that recommendation, closeout will make a final decision as to whether or not we will allow that overage or if we'll just say, no, we need that money back. <laughs> we refer to that as a retroactive budget realignment. So here we are with the indirect costs. 
And as we spoke about this earlier, so what you see on your left-hand side is your negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, your NICRA. If you go to uh, about the middle of the page, you will see that there are percentages which identify rates that are you allowed to charge for that particular period or time frame from whatever pro program year, I believe, for, I don't know if that's, I'm having a hard time seeing, but essentially each year you're given a, a rate that you can apply to that particular year based on a, a budget, based on your budget. And if you look at the line right below where there's a star, it will instruct you on how you can, what a cost you can use with regards to the base that you will use to charge the rate to. So sometimes it may be salary and wages and fringe benefits, and sometimes there may be other line items that are included in your base. Pay close attention to that base because our resolution specialists will check that with your numbers when you provide the indirect cost rate breakdown. And if it's not in agreement with what it should be, possibly disallowed costs. You want to say something? That's a 10%. Yes. So we have another question. Does the 10% flexibility also apply to the personnel category? Yes. So the answer to your question is yes. Every cost category is allowed that 10% flexibility. Moving on. The property certification form. Now, we speak of it as property, but essentially we're talking about the equipment. So if you look the upper left corner, that's the actual government property certification form, and there's two areas that you're able to sign in. One area is saying, yes, we do have equipment in our inventory that we purchased that at this point of closeout still has a fair market value of 5000 or greater. The other section says, no, we don't. If you sign in the area that says you do, you will receive a sample template that will be sent to you by the resolution specialist, which will give you the details that we need with regards to that equipment. Please ensure that based on the instructions that are provided to you, you make sure to provide us with all of the information required with regards to the equipment. And very importantly, there are a few columns that identify what you actually intend to do with that equipment after the period of performance end date. That will give us an understanding of what steps we need to take with regards to that equipment. So again, pay close attention to the instructions, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to the resolution specialist. Submission confirmation letter. This form right here is not something that I think you all will see, but essentially this lets your resolution specialist know that you have submitted your closeout financial report. That's a good sign. This is where we hope to get, your preliminary settlement letter. If you get this letter, then that essentially means that all of the documentation you have submitted has been satisfactorily completed. Your resolution specialist has checked it. They're pleased with it. They don't see any issues that cause any additional concern. You have officially closed out your grant award. Now, again, with regards to the Code of Federal Regulations, I believe it was, was the 344 post, the post closeout adjustment, there are th three bullet points here that just let you know that even though your award has been closed and we consider it for all intents and purposes off of our books, any disallowed costs that may arise based upon a later audit, you are still entitled to return those funds. Any rebates or credits that you may have received based off of expenditures that you made while the grant was active and a rebate came back to you after the fact, you still need to turn that back over to us. And the last bullet point is with regards to um, record retention in addition to the equipment aspect of what's required of you as the grantee after the closeout. Common misunderstandings. Expenditure amounts are higher than drawdown amounts. 
They need to match. So I don't know if you recall at this point in time, because I've been talking <coughs> for a moment. If we go back to that final quarterly 9130, line 10A, the cash receipts, and line 10B, the cash disbursements, did not equal the same amount that was on line 10E. That's because on the final quarterly 9130, 10A and 10B are fed from um, a governmental accounting system, which lets us know that at that particular point in time, you hadn't drawn down any more than that amount, so you can't exceed it. However, at the point of closeout, that's where you can make your adjustments. So don't get alarmed because those amounts don't match and that report won't let you override it. Understand that that's just what was recorded in our system at that particular point in time and you will have a chance on the closeout financial report to make the adjustment. Completing the equipment form correctly. Again, there are instructions that give you guidance with regards to what should be done based on how you intend to use the equipment after the period of performance end date. And that those instructions will pretty much let you know what we require of you at that particular point in time. Again, any confusion with what's required, just reach out to your resolution specialist and they'll ensure to walk you through it so that you're comfortable with what's required. All required forms and documents should be submitted. So again, at this point, um, Sometimes we have the closeout package submitted, which includes the detailed statement of costs, the grantees release, the property certification form, the tax form, and the grantee may not have submitted the closeout 9130. All of this means all required forms and documents. So at that 90th day, you should have submitted everything. So the best thing to do is not to wait to the very last minute to submit, thinking that I have 90 days. I'll submit on day 89. common issues that delay close out at the top of our list number one non-responsive grantees again we're going to keep our lines of communication open so we just ask that you do the same and you know that facilitates a, a very excellent working relationship so as long as you're willing to pick up the phone or respond to an email i'm sure we have an answer to solve whatever concern that you have refunds now, the thing with refunds is there's two ways that we do accept refunds. For the most part, if you are able to, we prefer that you submit a refund electronically the same way you drew the funds down. However, if for whatever reason you are unable to do this, we will take a physical check. It just prolongs the process. Equipment disposition. Again, with regards to the equipment letter that you will receive, based on how you decide that you're going to use that equipment, will determine what kind of instructions we will send to you to follow up with regards to disposition of the equipment if you decide that you no longer need it. 9130 issues. Um, I think that can be a myriad of things. I'm not quite sure. Okay. <laughs> I got a, I got a, I got a little uh, assist here. <laughs> so with 9130 issues, we're referring to issues related to the match or share requirement that is uh, in your grant award or administrative cost issues if you've, you know, exceeded the limits. Um, with that, remember that it's a 10% limitation you have on administrative costs, and that's 10% of the total award amount. Your match amount is a 25% match, so your federal shared requirement for match is 25%. Indirect cost issues, those tend to, yeah, those tend to delay closeout drastically. So I would just recommend that you speak with your resolution specialist. And again, they have the experience to inform you of what's required. And if they see something that's a concern that needs to be addressed, whether it's the base or the rate, um, as well as the fact that you have the option to hold off until you actually receive your final indirect cost rates. But we will close on provisional. So that's just, again, sometimes things that may delay our closeout process. Questions and disallowed costs. Again, with regards to match issues, um, administrative cost limits, um, indirect cost issues, 
maybe audit-related issues, maybe a monitoring report, anything that may cause some of the costs or expenditures that you spent under the award to be disallowed, that will delay the closeout. The budget realignment, that also, it slows the closeout process down. It doesn't necessarily delay it too long if you submit the justification and it is a reasonable request. It won't delay the process too long, but again, these are just some common areas that we see in closeout that do delay the process. Refunds. So again, two Code of Federal Regulation 200-343, Section D, just gives you examples regarding the refunds and what's required if you happen to come into receipt of money that actually should be refunded back to DOL. You are not let off the hook. You need to turn those funds back over as promptly as possible. I believe, for the most part, once we determine that there are funds that are owed to us, there usually is a time frame um, that you are given to return those funds. And if it's not returned in a prompt manner, interest, I believe, can accrue on those funds. FAQs are available on the YCC Community of Practice website. So if you all need some additional facts with regards to what's required, They've already uh, assigned a place where you can go find that information. With that, oh, I have one more, right? <laughs> Close out process FAQs. So this was a few questions that I think had come up before. And again, hopefully I explained that fairly well. But does marking yes on box six on the ETA 9130 trigger the closeout process? And in short, no, it does not. Your period of performance end date is what triggers the closeout process. So that, that in a nutshell, is, is the answer to that question. Um, grant in September 30, 2018. When does the grantee need to submit the final 9130 and the closeout 9130? Again, with regards to those two forms, the final 9130 should be submitted 45 days after the period of performance end date which is November 14th, 2018. And that closeout 9130 report, again, the last day that it should be submitted on is December 30th, 2018. Again, you don't have to wait that long, <laughs> but, um, but that, is the, that is the amount of time that has been allotted to you for your benefit. So we understand. When is the last time I can draw down funds? The same thing with the closeout 9130 report. Um, you want to make sure those funds are drawn down by December 30th. Otherwise, you will go in to try to pull down funds that you believe you're entitled to, and the system will say, not so fast. And I'm sure you will then make sure to communicate with your resolution specialist, see what's going on. So, again, let's just keep those lines of communication open, and we should, we should walk through this pretty smoothly. All right. Oh, excuse me. Hi. Thank you. No, you're good. Thank you, Avery, for um, sharing all of that information. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I know it's a lot of information, uh, but is there any other questions? Please keep sending those in, um, and we'll be happy to answer those. We are now going to turn it over to Evan and Maisha, and they're going to talk about some of the um, questions that came in to us more on the programmatic side of closeout. Um, we did create an FAQ on the programmatic side question, and then there's a second FAQ that is more about kind of what you just heard, the information you just heard on closeout. So both of those are on the YCC community of practice. Hopefully you have those available um, if you want to look at these answers. But we're going to walk through a couple that we felt were very um, important or that we thought all of you would have. So we're going to walk through those, but please continue to ask your questions as we move through. So Maisha. Thank you, Angela, and thank you to our grant office for giving that awesome closeout presentation. We really appreciate it. We'll be using that often <laughs> again, so don't keep that presentation handy for other grantees. So, everyone, we wanted to uh, make sure that we answered some of the key questions regarding extension or, or, or extending the period of performance. Um, and this one question we did receive about extending the period of performance based upon the, the, due, the end date of uh, December 31st. Um, can you extend the period of performance past December 31st, 2018 through the school year? Because, of course, we're a school-based program, and folks want to see if they can get that last semester of school um, 
involved in there. And so the answer basically is that um, you have to start your FBO. <laughs> Most, if you think that you want to do this, if you want to extend your period of performance, please speak to your FBO now as soon as possible. Every grant is different. Every grantee is different. And so it depends on your responsiveness, what your circumstances are, what challenges you may be having, what are you, what kind of activities you're trying to accomplish in that last component, um, anything that you are, your budget. Thank you. I'm trying to find the quicker, you guys. But I'm trying to hear. Hear? Okay. Um, also, you may not be eligible for an extension. Don't assume that you're automatically eligible for a no-cost extension just because you requested it. Again, you were talking to your FPO because if you're non-responsive to technical assistance or there's been some challenges with uh, reports being on time, um, budget issues, um, we want this grant to be successful, so you may get pushed back from your FPO. So again, if you're thinking now, over a year in advance, if you want a no-cost extension, you may want to start talking to your FPO now about that and getting those pieces and put into place. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I'm looking at my computer so I can read it and as well as up on the screen. What would the timeline, a timeline for requesting a period of performance no-cost extension be? Again, let your FPO know as soon as possible when you want to extend, when you want to have that done. So with the timeline for requesting it, you start soon, right? Requesting it not occur within two, the first two thirds of the original reporting, original operating period. So basically we have a, a little bit more than that right now, but what you want to do is you want to ex explore the opportunity and option with your FPO. So again, let them know as soon as possible what you want to do. Right? Did that answer that question correctly? I've been reading it all day. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let me try it. Okay. And my last question. This is Evan. This is Evan. Thank you, Evan. Got it, Evan. Can you, everyone unmute you in a second. Give us a second for Evan. Evan, can you talk? Thanks, Maisha. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you, yes, we can, can you hear, hear me you. okay? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to cover a couple more uh, PTS-related FAQs. So one we've gotten a few times is um, how it relates to sustainability and what um, cohorts grantees are on the hook for enrolling um, and whether or not um, they're expected to enroll new participants beyond year four of the grant. Um, and so we had that as one of our, our FAQs. And this first answer, I'm not going to read it, but it, it talks about the um, kind of the vision of sustainability within the SGA. Um, but then moving on to the next slide, which talks about um, the actual cohorts and where you are, and I'll walk through this, which is grantees are expected to enroll four cohorts of participants, one cohort in each full year of the grant. And so we are now um, kind of approaching the end of year three of the grant. Uh, we operate on a program year basis, July 1 to June 30th. So we consider June 30th of 2017 as the end of year three of the grant um, in terms of school years. So the um, upcoming school year that starts in the fall of 2017, that 2017, 2018 school year, that's the fourth and final year of the grant, so that's when you would enroll your final cohort. Um, and so beyond year four, you're not going to be reporting any additional PTS data to us um, in terms of new participants that might start in a year five, so to speak, if a grantee had a no-cost extension. However, if you do end up with a no-cost extension um, for one of those allowable reasons, you would continue to report PTS data on those cohorts that enrolled in the first four years of the program, um, as many of them would still be enrolled in the program. Um, and then at the end of the grant period, if it were just uh, four years of the grant, as you can see in this slide, my example was in a 9 through 12 model, you'll still have cohorts left that are either in their second year in the program, third year in the program, or fourth year in the program, and so to the best of a grantee's ability, using leverage resources you identify to sustain the program, we would expect you to continue to provide key elements to those um, participants that you enrolled in the program but have not yet completed the program. 
Um, in terms of the participant tracking system and its availability, it, it, it'll be available until approximately November of 2019. Um, or maybe late October of 2019, somewhere in that time frame. We're still working out the details. Um, but it should be available plenty long enough for you to um, use it for the end of your grants. Um, and then in terms of when does the last PTS data need to be submitted, uh, grantees enter PTS data as usual through the end of the grant period of performance. And similar to your final um, financial report, your final quarterly performance report is due 45 days after the last quarter of the grant period. But of course, grantees may submit that final QPR prior to that end of that 45-day period if they have the data available sooner. All right, back to you, Angela. All right, thank you, Evan. Um, again, we are here to answer all of your questions you have about closeout. So please send those in to us, type them in the chat or the Q&A. We have a couple we're gonna um, go back to the closeout office for, but please continue to ask your questions. This is your time to ask questions on closeout. Uh, so we had a question in the chat. Um, is there a process or formula for determining the fair market value of equipment? Well, to answer that question, there is no formal process for determining the fair market value of equipment. However, we do ask that you do do your diligent job of researching and trying your best to identify reasonable quotes. Because if you provide us with uh, a dollar amount for equipment or determine that it's something that shouldn't be reported, and we see it was a large value uh, item when you purchased it, we will request clarification on how you arrived at that fair market value. So as long as you do uh, just a diligent job of researching it, it should suffice for our purposes. But no, there is no formal process. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, and another question, uh, we just wanted to confirm that the 10% buffer applies to the personnel line item on the 424A. Uh, yes, it does, yes. Yes. All right. Uh, question in the chat coming in. Does so the question is? Does a no cost extension mean we can't spend grant dollars during that fifth year, or are unspent dollars still available? No cost extension. You get to extend. It's a no-cost extension meaning that you can, you have the permission to continue out the grant process for one additional 12 months. So yes, you'll be able to draw down those funds. But once the grant is closed, um, as stated before, by December 30th, 31st? Depending on one. If they receive a no-cost extension, because right now the grant ends in September yes. 2018. That means September 2019. So by December, yes. Yes. 2019. If, so if they were approved. So if you are approved to get a 12 month no cost extension taking you to September 2019, 2019, you can still draw down those funds. But once the grant is closed, no, you cannot. After December, 2018, if you were not approved for no cost extension or if you were approved for no cost extension, December 2019. Hopefully that made sense. Please let me know it made sense. No, December, you can't run that. <laughs> All right. And slide we had a question about slide 18, so I go back to slide 18. On slide 18, is column three the match and leveraged resources? No. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> I'm just going to um, No, there is no um, line item of, or match or level resources on the detailed statement of cost. However, that line is on the 9130 section line 11, recipient share. That's where you're going to um, indicate an, or report actually your match or leverage resource actually. Section 11. Yes. Right. All right. 9 11. Do we have any other questions coming in? 
Anyone else, any questions about financial things or uh, programmatic side of, of closeout? Okay, um, another question. What process occurs if you don't spend every dollar awarded as reported in the final closeout 9130? Oh. So I think you're referring to if there's, you didn't spend every single dollar, there's some leftover money, but it's deobligated back to the treasury. At the end, we're going to deobligate your fund. Let's say your award is for a million dollar and you only use 900,000. Um, so the 100,000 will be deobligated at the end um, and send it to the Treasury. Mm -hmm. All right, and another question. What is the breakdown of ICR, which is the indirect cost, indirect cost rate, mm -hmm. and what are the components that are broken down? So, Okay, with regards to the breakdown of the indirect cost rate, again, your indirect cost rate agreement will give you um, your indirect cost rate percentage per year. So it's done yearly. So what you have to do is based on your expenditures for that year, your base should come out of what you expended for that uh, for those particular cost categories that you're allowed to charge to your base. So if your base is salary and wages and fringe benefits, and let's say in year one, you spent um, $100,000 in salary and wages and fringe benefits, if the indirect cost rate that you were approved for, for that first year is 10%, then you would have to show us in the indirect cost breakdown, 100,000 times 10%, which gives you your 10,000. Year two, if you ended up spending 200,000, on your salary and wages and fringe benefits. Again, if the base in your agreement is still the same, the indirect cost rate may have changed. It may have gone down 5%, I'm not sure. So again, for year two, we now would like to see the 200,000 times 5% for the the, um, the sum of indirect cost that you charge the grant for that particular year. So essentially, cumulatively, you would take year one, year two, year three, year four, add those totals up, and they should be reported on that detailed statement of costs in the cumulative cost category as far as your final expenditure amount of indirect costs. Um, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, next question, if we have met our match requirements, should we continue to post additional match? Well, definitely. Um, what if they've met their match requirement, should they continue? If they yes. exceeded it, oh, yeah. should they continue? That would be great, actually. That's a very good um, way. Um, that shows that you're doing a good performance on your program. Um, so explain. Um, the match, the way we do the calculation on your match, um, even though when you came in, you got the award, is from the total award amount. Um, sometimes you might not expend all the funds, so the 25% is calculated based on your final expenditure report. Yes, yeah. So make sure, please, please make sure that you um, comply with the term and condition and get um, the 25%. Otherwise, like Avery mentioned, we do this a lot cost and <laughs> we want to avoid that. All right, the next question, will there be a site visit during closeout like there was during some monitoring visit? No, no, we don't do any site visits. We rely more on with on the program office and FPO on all your performances and on your financial. All right, any other questions coming in? Any other questions that you have while we have everyone here? All right, so I'm gonna, if you, if you think of anything, please type it in, but we're gonna kind of close out then. Um, so here's where you can contact us. You all know how to reach us, the YCC email, if we need to forward that on, uh, we will do so if you have questions that come up later. Um, and the next training we were planning to have was in May. We wanted to do a follow-up conference call on closeout. Once you start thinking about all the information we just shared, you may start to have more questions or as other staff maybe who weren't able to attend, 
watch the recording. There may be questions that come in. So we're going to host a conference call, not a webinar, just a conference call. In May, we're still determining that date. Um, and we'll be on, we're going to have someone from the closeout office on so that we can answer any remaining questions that come up and you all can kind of discuss any anything that we need to as follow up to this webinar. So that is going to be our next TA for all of you. Um, and as a reminder, we know the conference is coming up for YCC and we are going to be getting you all some information on that this week. Um, we're gonna be sharing the, the agenda and some hotel information this week, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and after today's webinar, when you close the webinar, you are going to um, get or open up on another screen a survey. Please do answer that. That helps us to make our TA better for all of you. We want to make sure we're serving your needs and answering all of your questions. So please do fill out that survey um, or evaluation and let us know how we're doing. Let us know if there's anything else you need from us so that we can respond to those needs. If there are no other questions, we thank you all so much for joining us. We thank Avery and Mary for joining us, Maisha and Evan for sharing their information, um, and all of you grantees for sending in your questions. Um, we hope we've answered all of them. If not, you know how to reach us, and have a great rest of your day. Yay.